Hello everyone, this is a video to walk you guys through the code and construction of a multi-LED circuit display I made. I made this using a Raspberry Pi 4 and a 40-pin GPIO extension cable, although that isn't actually necessary. A lot of inspiration for the code was from a similar video I've linked in the description, although I didn't end up using the techniques displayed in that video for reasons I'll get into later. I'll be covering the ins and outs of the various components used throughout the project along with all of the functions that are in the code. Without further ado, let's get started. First we start with the setup. I'm accessing my Raspberry Pi through SSH just like you would for any Linux server. If you're not familiar with how to use Secure Shell with the Raspberry Pi, I highly recommend you check out the video in the description. Once the operating system has been updated and subsequently upgraded, I can connect to the 40 pin extension cable to the GPIO pins that are on the Raspberry Pi. Raspbian comes with Python 3.7.3 and 2.9 by default, but you're free to use whatever you'd like. The only limitation I found was the use of formatted strings introduced in Python 3.6, but this is easily solved by running Python 3 instead of just Python. You're going to want to run sudo config in the terminal to enable I2C connections for the Raspberry Pi. This is important as it will allow the Raspberry Pi to receive data from an analog to digital converter, which we will use in this project. I imported the display modules for use in the project. I also needed something to test if the program was running correctly in the case of a severed ground connection. I placed a green LED to do just that, making sure to hook up a 220 ohm resistor so the LED doesn't fry up. This is the only other ground connection used, so all of the others are on the bottom right ground connection. Now to hook up the LEDs. I was originally going to use a line of multicolored LEDs, but I found a compact solution that would ensure I would have sufficient breadboard space. The LED bar component is an array of 10 red LEDs that are spaced 0 pins apart as opposed to 1 pin apart. I hooked up the anodes to a 20, 220 ohm resistors that were connected to individual GPIO pins and the cathodes to ground, just like the status LED. Moving on to some of the code, I assigned variables to the devices using the GPIO0 library I imported earlier. I also defined the patterns as an array of 10 digit arrays. The binary state of each integer defines whether the LED is on or off. The first one lights up only one LED, and the last one lights up all of the LEDs, or thinnest to thickest. I defined a global direction variable to define the direction that the pattern was cycling through. I also specified what would be the default selected pattern, which happens to be the thinnest width. I defined a cycling function that took in the direction as a parameter and then modified the selected pattern directly in one line. I know this isn't following the rules, but it allows for an easy solution with some drawbacks. The line works by creating a new list that moves the first element or to the end or vice versa depending on the direction. I then created a runtime function that uses a while loop that updates all of the LEDs using a for loop. There are two modes that the program uses, cycle and back and forth. The default is cycle as defined in the, our default variables, but the while loop is constantly checking for change in mode. Now we have base functionality. So how do we get our program to run? Well, to ensure that we run synchronized functions, we'll utilize the CPU threads on our machine. The Raspberry Pi has a quad-core processor, which means we have four synchronized tasks. So let's assign our update pattern function to the first thread. I've made a list of threads that will run their own functions. We can start these threads using a for loop. We also have to make sure that these threads are daemons, as this will allow for the threads to stop when the program has stopped. We'll use the pause function to ensure that the program continues to listen for new events, such as a click of a button. Now you can see that the selected pattern, which is the thinnest pattern, pattern 0, is cycling forever. I've added this button here to allow someone to toggle the direction using this simple conditional function. Even though global variables are bad practice and we should send data through arguments, they have to be used as they are void functions, which means they'll return a callback if we assign them to a variable. Now we can create our back and forth mode. This function essentially switches the cycle direction using the global direction variable and the cycle function itself. It switches every time either of the ends equal one. If any of the ends don't equal one, we don't necessarily know what the direction of travel is without the direction variable. I've added a toggle button with a toggle function to trigger a change in mode, exactly like the change direction button. Let's make sure to turn on the LS signal LED and trigger the applicable functions when the buttons are pressed. As you can see, the pattern changes direction when we click the small button, and the mode is switched when we click the big button. This has all been pretty simple so far with one-line toggle statements and pattern associations, but now we need to implement the potentiometers. My potentiometers have three prongs, one for power supply, one for output, and one for ground. I've used an ADC module to create this, but this can also be done with an advanced capacitor setup to measure the potential created. I'm using ADS7830 ADC, so make sure to refer to the instructions that come with your specific ADC as the wiring may be completely different. I hooked up my potentiometers using a video I linked in the description, so be sure to check that video out if you'd like a more in-depth look. I connected the applicable information transfer ports to the applicable GPIO pins, and the VCC to a 3.3 volt power supply. Now the Raspberry Pi can receive the data, but it can't yet read the data. For that, we need to specify commands in hexadecimal format for each analog input. I'm only using two potentiometers, so there are only two commands that I need to specify. I then create a reusable function that can take an index input to determine what device we want to read data from. 
Every potential meter has a base modifiable byte, which we can then write commands to depending on the device we want to target. We can then return the read data from the byte we've just modified. Now we have access to the current rotary state of the potential meter when we call the function. The potential meter is just two values, the speed of the pattern cycle and the pattern width. I also implemented a buzzer to indicate when the knobs were being turned, as there isn't an audible sound that comes from the potential meters. To implement the buzzer, I need to know if there was a change in potential meter state using a global variable. I modified the value and checked to see if the value had changed 0.2 seconds later using a while loop. If it had changed, I set the speed buzz variable to true, uh, which you saw earlier in the default variables, and set it back to false when the user was done turning the knob. I then set the base speed value to 0.05 seconds delay, and other values would be a concatenate string turned into a floating point decimal as I want to keep the values between 0 and 1. I performed the same procedure with the update width function, except without the concatenate string as it wasn't required. I then added these two functions to their own CPU threads. I hooked up a buzzer to the same ground connection and its own GPIO pin. The buzzer's on-off statement is passed into the update pattern loop. You can create your own function if you like, but I found it just cluttered up things. Now if you try twisting the knobs, the pattern should become thicker and should go faster. You can switch the twisting direction by switching the two outer cables. If you don't like the sound of the buzzer, feel free to disclude it from your project or implement a quick switch to cut off the ground connection when it is off. That's all for this video. I may have skimmed out on some details uh, in some areas, so feel free to ask clarification in the comments down below. Do check out the videos I've linked in the description if you'd like a better understanding of some of the concepts I've talked about. Thanks for watching, see you in the next one.